Okay, uh, hi everyone and uh, welcome to our weekly seminar. Um, today we're very happy to have Matteo Gosenza from the University of Vienna. Uh, Matteo has been a student uh, at the University of Sussex before moving for a postdoc uh, at the University of Auckland. Uh, and today she's going to tell us about simulations of fuzzy dark matter. So thanks again for joining us and please take it away. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. Uh, yeah, so I'm at the University of Vienna and uh, here's a list of my collaborators. I'm going to mainly talk about uh, yeah, simulations of fuzzy dark matter, but I'm also going to touch a bit on some previous stuff I've done with simulations with primordial black holes. So uh, here's the outline of my talk. Uh, I'm just going to kind of briefly introduce the problem of dark matter and then the ultralight or fuzzy dark matter. This basically means the same thing. I'm going to talk about um, what kind of problems we can attack with the simulations of fuzzy dark matter. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about this project we did, which was the simulations of uh, mixed fuzzy and cool dark matter. And in the end, I'll just briefly talk about the uh, simulations with primordial black holes as well. Um, so first of all, um, the evidence for dark matter is actually overwhelming by now. So we have from early observations of rotations, uh, sorry, rotation curves um, uh, in uh, spiral galaxies to like the peaks of the CMB power spectrum, um, the strong lensing in galaxy clusters, Lyman alpha forest, redshift space distortions, and this um, position of the uh, two-point correlation function in baryonic acoustic oscillations. All these observations, which are quite independent of each other, um, agree that, first of all, um, matter uh, content of the universe is around 30%. And out of that matter content, 85% uh, is dark. Um, so yeah, the, the observations are, um, um, there's no doubt on that side. Uh, on the other hand, the the theoretical explanation for dark matter is still um, lacking, let's say. Uh, so there are basically two options. The first is that there is some, some sort of new um, massive particle or object. Uh, and the second option is that gravity doesn't quite behave the same uh, on these uh, astronomical scales um, as it does on, on, the, on Earth or in the solar system. So I'm going to talk about this first option that, so that we have some sort of um, new uh, content in the universe. Uh, and if this is a massive particle, obviously one of the main most important parameters is the mass of the particle. Uh, and here the possible uh, models span this really huge parameter space uh, in the mass of the corresponding particle. So here on the really high end, we have the option that the dark matter is made up of primordial black holes. So this is sort of like the, um, uh, the solar mass and many orders of magnitude uh, smaller than that. Uh, then one of the most popular and one of the most established models is that uh, dark matter is made up of WIMPs, weakly, weakly interactive massive, massive particles. Um, and, but because we, we haven't found WIMPs, despite looking for them for a few decades now, people have started to look at the um, alternative to this. And one of, the, one of the main alternatives that are kind of becoming interesting today is that, it's, uh, that the dark matter is made up of our axion particles. Uh, and there are kind of two different distinct models for this. The QCD axions are a bit heavier, so they're around 10 to the minus 5 electron volts. And then the ultralight axions, and this is where I uh, mainly work on, are sort of in this really, really light regime of uh, 10 to the minus 22 to 10 to the minus 18 electron volts. Uh, so all of these models also have uh, constraints associated to them. So first of all, for primordial black holes, uh, we know that for the majority of this mass range, um, not all of the dark matter can actually be in primordial black holes. So they can constitute uh, some sort of um, fraction of the dark matter, but then um, the rest has to be something else. There's only this one small window here, uh, spanning sort of three, four orders of magnitude, where primordial black holes are still um, allowed to be 100% of the dark matter. Uh, then for WIMPs, uh, like I said, there are many experiments over the years, uh, which are now sort of hitting this uh, neutrino background. 
So the, the possibility to, to detect them is actually narrowing down and um, it might not be possible. Uh, and, and on the uh, axion side, there's also constraints on this, uh, on this mass of the axion, which I'm actually gonna uh, get to in a bit more detail later. So um, just a few words of motivation for, for the axion black matter. So you see the axions, um, they come from, they're basically a solution to the, um, to the uh, uh, charge parity violation problem. So this predicts that there can be this um, one term in the Lagrangian, which uh, causes a problem because it gives rise to the uh, electric dipole moment of the neutron. And uh, because that has been measured to be um, very, very, um, very, very small, but this predicts that it would be an order of magnitude. This is sort of a fine tuning problem. So um, Petchy Quinn suggested a, a solution, which is that there is a, um, a scalar field which enjoys the shift symmetry, and then this sort of sets at the bottom of the potential and therefore solves um, this problem uh, by setting this Lagrangian term to zero dynamically. On the other hand, uh, ultralight axions, um, which I mean can also uh, extend to higher masses, but here I'm kind of uh, writing this because this is what we consider relevant on, on the scales, on the astronomical scales that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so the motivation mainly comes from the string theory, uh, but they're also interesting for um, for uh, uh, cosmology because they address something called the um, small scale problems of the cold dark matter. Uh, these are namely the a core cusp problem and the missing satellite or too big to fail problem. Uh, so ultralight uh, dark matter or fuzzy dark matter, um, in principle, we describe this with a, with a scalar field, which obeys the Klein-Gordon equation. But then because uh, we are in the regime of, of low velocities, uh, we can actually um, uh, go into the non-relativistic li limit of this equation, and we get the, um, the Schrodinger equation here. So this is the, uh, the main equation that we will be solving. Um, so this, this psi is the, um, the scalar field, our, our uh, wave um, function, uh, and the potential here, uh, phi, is, is just solved by, um, we get it from the Poisson equation. So this is then the Poisson equation. And these are coupled then by uh, setting this density in the Poisson equation to be the, the square of the uh, scalar field. Uh, other things in these equations are, so this is the associated mass of the, of the fuzzy dark matter particle. Uh, and we are also in the cosmologically expanding background. So, so we have the scale factor here. Um, so this system has uh, an associated De Broglie wavelength associated to it. To it. Uh, and this, is, this just goes proportional to one over mass uh, and one over the velocity. Um, now for the ultralight dark matter, this De Broglie wavelength is of order uh, one kiloparsec. I mean, depending of course on the mass, uh, but to give you an idea, so um, we are eight kiloparsecs away from the sun. The earth is eight kiloparsecs away from the sun. So this is uh, sort of a bit smaller than that. So it's, it's, it's like an order of the galactic center. Um, then the simulations of fuzzy dark matter. Um, so this is actually from one of the earliest papers uh, by, uh, by Shai et al um, of, the, of the cosmological simulations of fuzzy dark matter. And here on the left-hand side, we have the, um, the fuzzy dark matter sim simulation. And on the right-hand side, we have the cold dark matter simulation. Uh, and these two were set up with the same initial conditions. And as you can see the, on, on these large scales, uh, so this would typically be the halos and the filaments and the voids around them. On these large scales, these look uh, remarkably similar. So uh, this is also called the Schrodinger Poisson loss of Poisson correspondence. So it basically means that on large cosmological scales, uh, fuzzy dark matter and cold dark matter behave exactly the same. Uh, and when I say large, it's actually it's large compared to the De Broglie wavelength 
of uh, the fuzzy dark matter system. Uh, however, on smaller scales, uh, there are significant differences. So if we zoom into one of these uh, halos, we see that in the center, uh, there's this very characteristic uh, solitonic core, uh, which has this um, characteristic profile. So it's, it's kind of flat in the center, and then it, then it, it um, falls off quite quickly. And around this core, there are these um, interference patterns. So this um, coherent patches, which uh, which fluctuate with some time scale. And this is very different to what you get with the cold dark matter. So um, with the cold dark matter, uh, there's, a, there's actually this uh, core cusp problem. So the simulations of cold dark matter pre predict this NFW profiles here. So uh, this NFW profile is, um, is kind of like a two power low profile. So for very small radii, um, the density goes as one over R. And then for uh, higher radii, the density goes as one over R cubed. Uh, but this means that in the center, it's actually quite high and it actually is quite steep. Uh, but what has been observed is that uh, in the centers of galaxies, actually the density kind of plateaus out. So it's, there's not the steep prediction from the uh, or, or fit from the cold dark matter simulations, but there is instead this plateauing of the density profiles. And this is called the, um, the core versus cusp uh, problem. Another problem is the, the missing satellite problem. Um, so here is a um, picture of the Milky Way uh, with the known um, satellites, all known satellites that we have. Um, sort of plotted on top of it. And here is a, a CDM simulation of a similar, um, similar like uh, uh, galaxy. And you can see that there's many, many more of these dark matter halos around it than what we observe. Now you could argue that uh, actually here also the halos are there, but because they, uh, um, because maybe they have been like stripped of stars or something, so they don't uh, contain enough stars, we actually don't observe them. Uh, but the problem, so the actually the extension of the sat missing satellite problem is a too big to fail problem, which says that these kind of large uh, subhalos would, there's no way to strip all, this, all the stars from them. So they should still be there and we should be observing them. Uh, so how does the how does fuzzy, how does fuzzy dark matter address uh, these problems? So first of all, for the core cusp problem, because we have this solitonic um, profile in the center, which actually plateaus. Um, I mean, you can see that this is kind of like a very similar shape. Um, and yeah, so what the what we observe in the simulations of uh, fuzzy dark matter is this characteristic uh, solitonic profile in the center and then the NFW-like halo around it. So this is where all these um, 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 perturbations around the, the core live. On the other hand, for the, um, for the too big to fail problem, um, we actually have the smoothing um, of the structure on these uh, smaller scales. And this depends on the mass of the uh, of the axion particles, so we predict we predict fewer um, um, structures, so fewer subhalos on small scales uh, in these filaments. But then, if you make the mass uh, uh, much higher, then you recover more and more of these um, subhalos, uh, and this is because the minimum mass for the for the collapsed um, subhalo goes as mass of the axion to the minus three halves. So for actually for higher uh, masses, you get more of these substructures. Um, okay, so this all seems quite nice, but uh, one thing I should actually say is that, uh, although this is a possible solution, uh, so far as they matter solve this, this uh, uh, problems, skeptics would say, um, that actually what you observe is always um, something baryonic. So it's either stars or gas. So it, it also could just be that in the, 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 the problems of the cold dark matter can be resolved by just considering baryonic 
um, effects. So this is another possible um, resolution to this. Um, but um, Fasiak matter is also, uh, although it seems very nice, although it seems like a perfect solution to this, it's also quite strongly constrained. So first of all, from linear cosmology, from the CMB, um, subhalo mass function. So you actually uh, should not smooth out this abstraction on the, on the small scales too much from the Lyman alpha forest uh, and something called the black hole super, super radiance here on this a bit heavier masses. Uh, but then there is still like a window of opportunities here. And on the other hand, all these constraints assume that, um, uh, that all of the dark matter is actually fast dark matter, so 100%. Uh, and uh, we decided to relax these constraints by considering actually a, a simulations of mixed fuzzy and cold dark matter. So here, some fraction of the dark matter is, is fuzzy and the rest is cold. And for this purpose, we developed uh, a new code called Axionix. Uh, and with this code, we solved the, the Schrodinger Poisson system in the cosmological expanding background. Um, this code is actually based on another, called, another code, code called Nix uh, and another library called AMRX for the adaptive mesh refinement. Uh, and this is one of the main features of, of this code. This is why it's very nice. Um, so um, on this, uh, on the main, in the main box, we have uh, the base grid. And then in the regions where something interesting is happening, we can actually refine and increase the resolution. Uh, so yeah, like I said, we, um, uh, with this, we simulate uh, mixed dark and uh, uh, fuzzy uh, dark matter uh, models. Uh, with various fractions of the fuzzy dark matter. And our code is also very uh, uh, well uh, parallelized using OpenMP and MPI, and it's publicly available. So what I'm showing here is a, a spherical collapse of an isolated halo. Uh, so here we start with some um, initially um, very spherical overdensity, which over time collapses. Uh, and you see that in the center, um, of this uh, halo, there's actually this uh, solitonic core, uh, and then these fluctuations around it. Um, so this was, uh, I think the base grid was like 1024 uh, cells. And then we have here uh, six levels of refinement. And actually this spherical collapse is, is a perfect um, tool to demonstrate how well this refinement works because uh, like most of the region here, because it's isolated, is, is actually empty. So you don't want a very high resolution here, but then in the center, you do want a high resolution. Uh, and I should also say that the symmetry here is broken. So initially this, um, um, this perturbation is symmetric, but then the symmetry gets broken because you're actually simulating something spherically symmetric on a cubic grid. And so all these perturbations um, break the spherical symmetry and you get um, this kind of structure with the solitonic core and then the fluctuations around it. Um, so a few more words why we uh, consider this mixture of uh, fuzzy and cool dark matter. So first of all, the bright sector has many different particles from electrons, which, I mean, the whole standard model of particle physics. Um, and then therefore, why would we really expect the dark sector to only have one? So it's kind of like, why not? Uh, second of all, um, when axions uh, are created, uh, it's likely that there isn't just one, um, one particular mass at which they're created, but there's like a whole continuum uh, of them created simultaneously. Uh, so, so you could maybe even imagine like a case where you had two different masses, one really heavy, one really light of, of, of uh, axionic particles. And then this uh, on cosmological scale would behave exactly like the system that we have. So the light particle would behave as the fuzzy dark matter and uh, the heavier particle would effectively behave as a cold dark matter. Uh, and yeah, and, and lastly, single, uh, single mass particle scenarios are very strongly constrained. And this is the way to, to sort of um, alleviate these constraints. 
uh, numerical techniques that we used. So on this base grid, we have the spectral methods. So this is the Fourier transform, and then you solve the um, the Laplace in Fourier because it's much easier. Uh, and on the uh, refined levels, we have the finer difference. So this is more expensive, but you can only use spectral methods if you have um, if you have periodic boundary conditions, which in these boxes here on the smaller, you of course don't have. Uh, and then for the particles, uh, which are also simulated here, um, uh, we use n-body methods, which were already implemented in Nix. Uh, ah, and one thing I should still say about this is this was a simulation with 30% fuzzy dark matter and 70% cold dark matter. Uh, so this, so I mean, what is shown here is really just the fuzzy component, but there are also particles on top of this. So after we um, we tested our code extensively, and you can see all this test in the, in the paper. Um, we looked at some more interesting um, uh, cases. So uh, first of all, we looked at the spherical collapse in the linear regime. Uh, so now we have uh, here, the colors on these plots are the fuzzy dark matter fraction. So this is basically the ratio between the density of fuzzy dark matter and the total. And the red color is um, is so all of it, uh, all of the dark matter being fuzzy, and the blue color is all of the dark matter being uh, cold. Um, and so what we did here is we initiated a again a spherical overdensity, very small, um, which then collapses because of its own gravity. And the overdensity here was only in the um, cold dark matter um, uh, regime. So uh, we run that, and we can see the fuzzy dark matter. Initially, there is no um, there is no overdensity, but with time, um, the fuzzy dark matter also falls into the gravitational potential created by the cold dark matter. And the nice thing about this is that we actually have uh, analytical solutions. So these are the equations governing the overdensity evolution with time for the cold and for the fuzzy dark matter. And as you can see, they're coupled. And they're basically uh, almost the same, apart from this fuzzy dark matter having this extra term, which accounts for these um, coherence um, uh, effects. So for this uh, wave-like structure of the fuzzy dark matter. Uh, and then uh, this can actually be, be solved, and you get these, these solutions. And you can see that our uh, numerical solutions, which are the, uh, the full lines here, um, actually uh, uh, correspond to this um, analytical solution in dashed very nicely. So this nicely follows each other. Uh, but then another thing that we did is we also initiated some um, overdensity in the fuzzy dark matter part on top of this. Uh, so this initially just uh, decays because the scale at which this is initiated is actually smaller than the gene scale, so it can't collapse by its, uh, by its own. Uh, it's the collapse is not the collapse conditions are not satisfied, so it it decays and then it oscillates for a while and then once the um, uh, cold dark matter actually forms deep enough gravitational potentials. Uh, these also uh, fall in, and then they follow the same, um, exactly the same lines as without uh, any perturbation here. Uh, okay, and then the next thing we did, we actually looked at the nonlinear, non-spherical collapse. Uh, sorry, <laughs> spherical collapse in the nonlinear regime. Um, and here we get these density profiles, uh, very similar to what we saw before. So uh, here now the, uh, the red lines are the fuzzy dark matter profiles, density profiles, and the blue lines, blue lines are the cold dark matter density profiles. Um, and we see that in the, so this is, um, this is basically density as a function of radius. Uh, and every single one of these panels is a different fraction of, uh, of fuzzy dark matter in the simulation. So here at the bottom end, we have uh, all of the dark matter is fuzzy. And here we have a very small proportion of dark matter is fuzzy. 
Um, so uh, in the bottom, we of course see that this very characteristic, characteristic solitonic shape with the um, NFW profile around it. And then for different, um, different fractions, we see that these at the large scales, uh, these uh, uh, density profiles actually have almost exactly the same uh, shape. So they really uh, are, uh, they really follow each other very nicely. And, uh, and the separation here is really just the initial um, fraction. So the initial ratio between them. So you can see nicely here in the case where like half of it is cold and half of it is fuzzy, uh, that these two lines actually lie on top of each other. And then of course, for uh, more cold dark matter, uh, cold dark matter dominates. Uh, but on the so on the small end uh, things, uh, we see that this uh, uh, soliton forms, but it only forms uh, if you have enough fuzzy dark matter, and we kind of like estimate this to be sort of ten percent. So you have if you have more than ten percent of fuzzy dark matter, then the uh, the soliton will perform. Otherwise, it's like kind of there, but this fit doesn't really work nicely anymore. Um, okay, so here on the left hand side, we then investigated the uh, velocity distributions. So this is kind of like um, the velocity spectra, velocity on the on the x axis. Uh, so we did this by um, by basically doing the Wigner transform of the of this wave function here, and then integrating over the space up to, uh, I think, four kiloparsecs. So, so here, so this inner region. Um, uh, so so this, is, this was chosen so that it's, um, that it's smaller than the virial radius. So these lines here are the virial radius, but larger than the core radius of the soliton. So it's, it's somewhere in between. Um, and then we actually get that uh, for more fuzzy dark matter, these um, uh, velocity distributions sort of occupy um, higher velocities, higher velocity numbers. Uh, but the, um, uh, the cold and the uh, fuzzy dark matter actually have, again, very similar profiles. Uh, and I should also say that the, the cold dark matter profiles were just obtained from the particle information. So now we can take um, the peaks of these of this distributions here, and we plot them um, as a function of the core radius of the soliton. Uh, and this is, OK, this is like a bit technical plot, and I'll try to explain. Um, so we basically take the peak of each one of these uh, um, so, so for, of the of the fuzzy and of the cold dark matter distribution, um, and so these diamonds here are the fuzzy dark matter, and the pluses are cold, and you can see again the blue colors being the being higher um, cold dark matter fraction. So for mo for cold dark matter for uh, mostly cold dark matter simulations, uh, the velocity is actually pretty much following the virial velocity of the halo. So the velocity, even in this central region, is not distinguished from the virial velocity plotted here. But then as we go towards um, higher uh, fuzzy dark matter fractions, uh, we see that the velocities actually deviate from this virial velocity. Um, so this basically means that the soliton when it forms, if it forms, creates its own environment around it where velocities are actually higher. So this is kind of like this, this why it's, it's supported against the collapse uh, in the center. Uh, and then we also see that this, um, uh, this shape here follows very nicely this one over R. So R, uh, RC is the core radius uh, function, which was first proposed by, uh, Philip Mott in one of his papers. Um, yeah, so this this basically tells us that uh, uh, in the center, the 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 soliton, um, I mean, the soliton creates an environment where velocities are much higher than they would be just from the virial uh, velocity of the halo. Uh, okay, so. Um, 
Where was I? Okay, so uh, then we uh, also looked at the spherical collapse in the linear, linear regime uh, uh, in a bit more detail. So um, here we plot the, the maximum um, fuzzy dark matter over density as a function of scale factor. So this is like time, and this is just the highest cell in the simulation, um, the over density of that cell as it collapses. So we see that uh, initially we just uh, have this um, uh, nonlinear collapse. And then uh, at this point, the halo virializes. And for these um, low fuzzy dark matter fraction uh, scenarios, it basically just basically stays like that. But for more fuzzy dark matter, fra um, more fuzzy dark matter in the simulation, um, the, the central so the density in the soliton actually keeps growing and it grows more uh, if there is more um, fuzzy dark matter. So looking at now at this in the in the um, uh, for the amplitude versus the freefall time. So the freefall time is just the time it takes for uh, a system to collapse under its own gravity. So we see that this kind of happens at 1.5 freefall time, this, this condensation of the soliton happens. Um, and then it actually grows linearly. And uh, we get this, this fits um, to the, so the, um, so the dashed lines are fits and the full lines are the, the data from the simulations. And we get that uh, these fits very nicely follow this um, linear relation, uh, first given by Levkov, where then, uh, also this um, condensation time scale appears. So this is the condensation time scale, which is which was actually derived in this paper. Um, and this is just the time scale at which um, initially the the, um, uh, the sorry the soliton uh, condenses, but then it also appears in this in this linear growth here which is kind of interesting. And uh, as far, we don't quite understand yet why this, this has this linear relation here. Uh, okay, so now I wanna talk about something completely different a little bit. Uh, so this was a project that I did before I started working on uh, axion dark matter uh, and it involved, in, involved primordial black holes. So primordial black holes form uh, in the early universe, um, uh, just by pure gravitational collapse, if this initial lower densities are of order one, so this is for, for the for some scale, as soon as it enters the horizon after inflation, it collapses if this is like a very rare um, and high over density. Uh, then strong constraints exist on the fraction of dark matter that can reside in primordial black holes. Um, but then if the primordial black holes are there and if they consist only a fraction of the dark matter, then the rest, of course, has to be something else. Uh, and the obvious, um, uh, of course, one of the obvious candidates is the WIMPs. Um, and in this scenario, basically, WIMPs form halos around primordial black holes because primordial black holes form first, then they create this gravitational wells, and then WIMPs gradually uh, fall into the gravitational wells and they create these halos. Um, but then the idea is that if you have a lot of dense wimps in the halo, they will annihilate uh, just by um, some particle process uh, and emit all sorts of products um, from gamma rays to neutrinos, antimatter. Uh, and we were specifically interested in these gamma rays here because the non-detection of the gamma ray background uh, directly translates into the constraints on the primordial black holes. So in this paper here, we actually consider this hybrid model. So we had primordial black holes, which were just modeled by one really heavy particle in simulation. Um, and this was always constituting a small proportion of the total matter and the rest of the, of the, rest of the matter was just cool dark matter or WIMPs. Uh, and we simulated, uh, again, the density profiles, so the overdensity with, with radius um, around these primordial black holes. And what we see is that they're, this, these are very steep um, profiles. So, uh, so towards the, 
smaller radii, they just have this one power law profile all the way through. And this is important because this um, WIMP annihilation signal actually depends on the, on the square of the density profile here. So uh, if you integrate this, uh, if you have these kind of steep profiles, you would typically expect a lot of an annihilation signal. But then because um, with um, uh, like looking just at the Fermi ray, uh, sorry, Fermi gamma ray background, um, uh, we can actually place constraints on this uh, uh, ratio of the, uh, of the total matter density, which is in primordial uh, black holes versus the total. Uh, and this is actually a very cool result that we got here. Um, so we consider three different um, WIMP masses, uh, which is kind of where this, this um, instrument is sensitive. And we got that the fraction of the primordial black holes uh, can be at most 10 to the minus nine. So really, really tiny. Uh, so this means that either if there are primordial black holes, if there, even if there are like just a few of them, like very small fraction, uh, then um, the rest of the dark matter cannot be WIMPs. Or on the other hand, if one day we discover WIMPs and we see that the, the dark matter is actually composed of WIMPs, then um, this rules out primordial black holes. So since this actually, so we, we actually um, considered primordial black holes um, of the sort of solar mass. So this mass was around uh, one solar mass. And I think some other groups have since done also studies with uh, lower masses and so on. But uh, this was kind of the first result, which kind of rules out this hybrid model of uh, PBHS and WIMPs. OK, and this brings me to my final slide. Um, so I think one of the main conclusions is that dark matter is really one of the most important problems today in, in astronomy. But the search for dark matter particle has so far only given us constraints. Um, fuzzy dark matter is one of the most interesting, most compelling candidates for, for dark matter. Uh, but also mixed dark matter uh, models should be considered um, for the reasons that I mentioned. Um, so from the simulations of fuzzy and cold dark matter, um, we saw that on large scales, really this Schrodinger Poisson Vlasson Poisson correspondence um, is confirmed. So which means that fuzzy and cold dark matter behave approximately the same. Uh, on the other hand, on smaller scales, so this is around the, the Gros wavelength, uh, fuzzy effects uh, are present. Uh, there's the solitonic core, and then there's all these interference patterns around. Um, and this happens if, um, if the fuzzy dark matter content is at least 10%. Uh, on the other hand, uh, simulations of primordial black holes and WIMPs together show that uh, these two forms, so this hybrid model, uh, so these two forms cannot coexist, so either one or the other. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Matea, for a very interesting talk. Uh, we have enough time for some questions, so just feel free to speak up. Matea, thank you for the very clear talk. Um, I have what maybe is a bit of a naive question. So you discuss how fuzzy dark matter is one of the solutions to this problem of these extremely cuspy profiles. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, when I look later in the talk, mm -hmm. um, I see that as the fuzzy dark matter fraction goes up in these mixed models, you have a larger amount of dark matter rather than a smaller amount at small radii. And so I feel I must be missing something or confusing what the normalization point is. Do, do, you, do you see my problem? Um, so you're saying that uh where this i mean i mean these are these are sort of like of the same order i mean here you have to add the two uh curves together right yeah i have to add the curves together 
Yeah, because the total, I mean, the total, um, the total profile is then the, uh, the sum of them, right? Okay, and it's a log scale. So let's see the All right, so okay, the 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 case where fuzzy dark matter is absent or very small is the very top one. Mm -hmm. And there I see, okay, the cold dark matter density is it's, it was somewhat smaller than than here. Yeah. Um, so those are all on the same scale. I. Uh, yes. Is the, the is the critical is the critical radius off the left hand side of the plot? Is that part of what's happening? Or. Uh, what do you mean by the critical radius? So this is the so core you, radius. The, the, the point is, the the complaint is that in cold dark matter. There is, uh -huh. there is too much, the density becomes too large at very small radii to the point where if you go to tiny radii, the density completely explodes. That's, that's the complaint in this cuspiness problem. Ah, uh, I see. And I yet see. In, in your fuzzy dark matter rich models, I seem to see a higher density than I see in the fuzzy dark matter poor models. And I'm, so I'm trying to understand yeah, yeah, I, I'm. I'm sorry, it took me a while to. How it can both increase so, the density and solve the problem of the cuspy. So, so here, the oh. the the leftmost radius is given by our resolution. Okay. Right? So, uh, but in the so here we have just this uh, N of W profile. Yep. So here it goes as one over R cubed, and then one over R, uh, one over R, and then I mean for. Uh, scales that we don't resolve just just continues right yeah so it would just continue on as, as one over r and would actually reach higher um values um for for smaller radii than than this does okay Whereas so maybe here, that's it, the solution to the problem yeah so here it actually plateaus and it doesn't increase but of course we only um resolve up to some radius and for fuzzy dark matter that's perfectly enough but for cool dark matter if this n of w profile extends uh all the way to the center then then this keeps increase, increasing as well oh, okay so it's it's a problem it's an issue with the left hand scale all right thank you i think i understand that now thanks thank you for the question sure any more questions um, yeah, maybe I can ask if, did, so in these um, kind of axiverse models, you have the prediction that you have rather than a single axion, you have a kind of spectrum of axions mm -hmm. of a kind of range of masses. Do you have a feeling of that sort of scenario is possible to simulate where you don't just have a single mass, but a, a spectrum of masses? So you have a kind of range of de Broly scales? Yeah, I, I've thought about this a little bit. Um, it would be, I mean, quite difficult because you would need for, for each one of these. So, so first of all, I think you would have to somehow, um, uh, instead of a continuous spectrum, you would have to choose probably some discrete values of the mass and simulate maybe, uh, I don't know, a few of them, a number of them, 10 or whatever. Um, but then, I mean, this would be a quite expensive simulation because you would have to um, basically evolve them uh, and couple them to each other. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, I've never heard of such simulations being done, but I think it's a very interesting question. So because, I mean, this is basically what the, this axiverse is predicting. So I think in the future, maybe this will be something that will be considered. Uh, but so far, um, it's it's, quite hard, I think. No one's no one's attempted it yet, at least. Okay, anybody else? Um, I have a question um, to the, the second part of the talk with the primordial mm -hmm. technology. Oh, yeah. um, so, so what are the assumptions which go in 
there exactly. So does it apply for every WIMP model or we must assume something that some annihilation rate is there for WIMPs or? Um... Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, a cross section. And also there's um, uh, the, the mass of the WIMP is also uh, just in, in, in these ranges. Mm -hmm. So, so, but, but you need the, so, so I think one additional assumption there is that cross section annihilate, annihilation cross section into photons. Yeah. And that, that annihilate into a line then, or into just a broad spectrum, or is there some? Um, so, it's probably more like a line. Uh, treatment. Yeah, I would imagine. Uh, I mean, that cross section also depends on the mass, right? So, I'd imagine for a different masses it the 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 signal is at different frequencies uh, but yeah this is yeah this is definitely an assumption so so but, but it kind of the photons come directly from the annihilation of the dark matter and are not secondary products right where you basically would have a cascade and you have brandstrahlung or things like that and so so your dark matter annihilates directly into two photons into photons yeah 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 and then you detect the photons exactly <laughs> Okay. Uh, I mean, th there might be like other channels, actually, because I mean, this is just uh, yeah, looking at these gamma ray products, but there might be like um, other um, other particles or whatever which are produced in this annihilation, which then you can detect um, in, in the gamma ray. I don't know. Yeah, but here you would see a photon line, I guess, in that spectrum. I think that's the assumption. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Oh, thank you. We have a few more minutes uh, for any last questions. Um, yeah, I also have a question. Um, but looking at the velocity distribution, so the plot that you were showing before, um, it, it seems like they they start to uh, deviate from each other uh, on the in, in the middle case where they have cold half fuzzy. Um, because in the extreme cases, the, 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 the shape at least matches quite, quite, uh, quite good. So, um, yeah, can, can you comment a little bit on, on that maybe? Yeah, thank you. That's uh, quite a good observation. Uh, yeah, of course, this is what's happening. Um, so here I would say that um, the uh, cold dark matter, the pluses, they kind of prefer to follow this virial velocity curve here. Whereas the, um, the fuzzy dark matter really quite soon starts to follow this uh, other line here. So here in the middle, you kind of have a little bit of a discrepancy because um, the cold, so if you have purely cold dark matter, this you know, drags to one side of the things. If you have purely fuzzy, then it drags the remaining of the dark matter with itself. But here in the middle, there's like a little bit of um, discrepancy between here. And this is, this is what you are, this is what you observe here, yeah. But yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a good good observation. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I see the, um, yeah, I, I get the point. So, um, so it's not that one one side or the other wins, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so um, I think we had the last minute questions. Uh, or Actually, we... Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so I was wondering, because um, the both the fuzzy dark matter and cold dark matter in the same simulation, did you have to modify the Lagrangian perturbation theory for the initial conditions? Or did you okay, just... Okay, so... Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the initial conditions here were very simple. This is just a spherical collapse. So we just had like, uh, maybe here, we just have like a spherical over density maybe of size that's some fraction of this box. Uh, and then it, it just collapses under its own gravity. And then uh, when you have fuzzy dark matter, this fuzzy dark matter gives additional sort of pressure here. Um, but the way the um, fuzzy and cold dark matter talk to each other, this is really just via the Poisson equation. So they both feel the same gravitational potential and they both source the same gravitational potential. So um, 
yeah, they're really only coupled um, through gravity. Okay, so you just give them the initial kick based on the fact that they're all falling into this potential, into the same place, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just like initial over density, uh, and then this collapses. So the initial conditions here are not proper cosmological. This is work in progress, but they are just uh, um, just a spherical collapse, an isolated one. Okay, and yet um, I, I don't know. Do, um, is there like do you guys have some ideas on how to do this more generally in cosmological context or? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. This is the next the next thing. Then when you when you actually be, um, I mean the a plot. Uh, you want something like this, right? So full cosmological simulation. So here you just need to give the power spectrum um, of the um, that you get from I don't know from the CMB at some initial redshift, and then initialize uh, these initial perturbations, and then they will uh, they will. I mean the the code is the same. The um, I mean kind of the idea of the solving is the same, but just the initial conditions are different and of course you need a lot more computing power because there is a lot more going on and you have more regions where you want to refine um, and just the whole box is bigger typically so yeah. actually that um that leads to my other question i was wondering how does a runtime scale with like adding more fuzzy dark matter into the simulation uh i think adding fuzzy dark matter didn't actually affect that uh, very much because you still do the same number of steps right on every step you want to um you want to like evolve the fuzzy dark matter and the particles and then calculate the gravitational potential from the Poisson equation so you have basically the same number of steps so so these are all the same uh there's all the same uh, okay time. great thanks yeah thank you for your questions uh, very good. Uh, I think we can finish the official part at least.